Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I've got to confess, this is not my main uh, geographic area of expertise, though it is my kind of historical area, uh, or time period anyway. Um, most of my earlier work has, has looked at the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Valley um, as kind of waterscapes of interaction. And so I wanted to think about how to do that on the Llano Estacada, right, where water is not as pr prominent as uh, it was during uh, or in other regions of the country. So I'm going to start out in June of 1788, when a French adventurer named Pierre Vallet, or sorry, Vial, departed Santa Fe on his second official mission with the Spanish government across the Llano Estacado. Endorsed by the Spanish in Santa Fe, Vial and another individual, Jose Mares, had been crisscrossing the staked plains for the better part of three years by this point. They were seeking viable routes of trade that could connect the Spanish colonial empire's um, possessions in Santa Fe and San Antonio, as well as the more recently acquired Louisiana territory, which Spain had assumed from France in 1763. For this new adventure, Vial had been tasked with finding a direct route across the New Mexican settlements to the trading hub of Nacogdoches in Louisiana. And he and his companions climbed the western escarpment of the tableland in July 2nd, on July 2nd, following the Pecos River Valley uh, east. Uh, they then entered the tableland above, uh, crossing through what the New Mexicans called El Puerto de Rivajanos, right, a spring. And such springs, or ojos, um, along the rim rock were the common points of entry onto the plains for New Mexicans and for this French adventurer turned Spaniard. There were good watering places that likewise provided natural doorways onto the high tableland above. And you can see this map comes from Vial's explorations. Uh, it's not a very good image probably from where you're sitting, but you'll note that he marks the route from Santa Fe across the staked plains down into the river valleys of the rolling plains beneath, uh, marking different playas and low points and spots of water along the way. And this map has actually uh, been refound uh, fairly recently in the archive of the Indies in Seville, Spain during the, the 1990s, right? And so we're able to kind of trace his route across the playas of the northern part of the staked plains. And after years of living among native peoples in the Texas Plains and learning to trust his Comanche companions on this route in 1788, Vial entered the Dantignano with a certain level of confidence. Both he and his counterpart, Mares, had ventured through this region successfully several times now, never wanting for water, despite the area's reputation, quote, right, as a plain without landmarks, sustenance, or water. The party set out across this landscape where one sees only sky and plain, as they put it. But in the course of their first day's travel across the grassland, they managed to stop at over 14 different ponds, or playas, with considerable water in them. The party would, uh, followed what would become known as the northern route for this particular expedition between the Tierra Blanca Creek and the headwaters of the Red River before descending into the canyon lands on the eastern side of the escarpment. Here, they likewise encamped along a puerto, or Ojo de Agua, a spring described as a literal eye of water beneath the rim rock's brow, where they encountered more Comanches who spoke of other routes across the Llano. Each of these routes were described by the native people as paths of living water, or in Spanish, la pistas de agua viva. These pathways of living water, known by the Comanche and other native people, set the terms of engagement on the high plains from pre-contact into the 19th century. And today, I'm going to be exploring some of the ways that these waterscapes shape the context of cross-cultural encounter on the High Plains. Now, as I mentioned, my wider research focuses on waterscapes as important sites of cross-cultural interaction across North America. My larger contention is that whether we're talking about the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Valleys, where extensive waterways serve as the main venues of collaboration and contestation, or we're talking about a region like the Llano, where limited water can find travel, trade, and interaction to certain key routes, uh, water stops, and riverbeds, 
Water in both contexts defined the spaces in which incoming Europeans and native peoples interacted. Most of us grew up thinking about uh, settler expansion and conquest as something that happens across you know, a flat landscape, right? You kind of picture those old images of wagons rolling west, or maybe those old paintings of manifest destiny, right? Uh, these are the residual mindsets of a kind of manifest destiny, Frederick Jackson Turner frontier thesis idea of how uh, Euro-Americans go about conquering North America. In this older imagining, native people exist across open landscapes as people to be acted upon, to be conquered, right? But if we put water back in the equation and start thinking about the ways that waterborne geography shaped the terms of contact, we get glimpses of a truer picture that allows us to see how indigenous agency worked, highlights the importance of native knowledge about lands and specifically waterways in North America, and reminds us in general of just how uncertain conquest of North America was for Spanish, for French, for British, and for later Americans in the face of daunting American landscapes and terrain and the native people that called the continent home and knew these waters as their home waters. <laughs> Interacting along waterscapes set the terms of encounter then for good or ill from early Spanish contact through the conquest of the American interior by the United States during the latter part of the 19th century. Understanding how relations played out along waterways and crossover points between watersheds or water sources then is key to understanding the broader trajectory of Native American history and frontier history on the state plains as well as elsewhere on the continent. Now, now hydrographically speaking, there are two main water forms on the state plains as we've already heard uh, throughout our three days here. Well, we're on the third day, I guess. Uh, the first are the draws, right? These slight defiles, uh, the most significant ones around here being Yellow House Draw and Blackwater Draw, uh, that fill with water during rains and form runoff drainages off the Cap Rock onto the Rolling Plains rivers below. These drainage courses guided many Comanche paths of living water, the most prominent one connecting kind of where we are today to Portalis on the uh, western end of the Cap Rock. Um, and draws are significant because they directed the course of travel for generations of native people, as well as ciboleros, comancheros, sheep herders, would-be fur traders, and other adventurers who dared to cross the state plains. The other key water feature, which we've also heard a good deal about, and I think we'll hear more of today, are the playas, right? You can see them pictured here on this overhead image. And these playas, are uh, kind of a distinct and crucial ecological form of the staked plains. Uh, in times of rainfall or flooding, they will fill with water. They provide rare wetland habitat in otherwise semi-arid uh, plains, which in turn serves as kind of a necessary stopover habitat for migrating waterfowl, shorebirds, as well as historically watering holes for endemic wildlife like bison and pronghorn. And playas have been a key site of sustenance for humans on the Llano since the Paleolithic era, but I'm going to leave that era to the archaeologists today. Um, in the contact period, these shallow basins of water could mean life or death for those crossing the Yana. And native knowledge of the locations of playas and their awareness of whether or not they were full mattered a great deal. As one Comanche explained to a trader in the early 19th century, these catchments of precipitation were not simply accumulated rainwater. He corrected the trader. They were, quote, a gift from the Great Spirit, provided explicitly for their crossing, for those crossing the dry lands, and meant for those who deserved the blessing. Okay? So the idea that playas kind of shaped the routes through which people would cross the Llano um, is a, a prominent theme. During the era of contact, these playas made an impression on early European observers who noted them as distinct parts of the Llano Estacado. As early as Coronado's famous uh, adventure across the plains in 1540, Spanish observers described how occasionally they were found some ponds round like plates, a stone's throw wider or larger, some contained fresh and others salt. And the playa stuck out to the Spanish conquistadors as unique as their guide, known as El Turco, led them across this plain. 
One prominent biologist of the high plains ecology has even suggested, and I, we've heard different uh, debates about this over the last few days, that Llano Estacado might actually be a garbled descriptor for the Llano Estanzado, a plain of stagnant water, right, or standing water. But despite this early entrada onto the high plains, indigenous power kept further Spanish efforts at bay for, most, for more than a century. First through noteworthy blows to Spanish power, like the Pueblo Revolt in New Mexico, and later during the ascendancy of the Comanche on the southern plains. By the 18th century, French adventurers had begun to probe the water routes towards the Llano Estacado on their continually expansive search for furs and trade opportunities. And the French are kind of the unexpected visitor to the Llano Estacado, right? We always kind of expect the Spanish conquistadors, we hear about Coronado, we hear about later Americans. What we don't usually think about are the French interlopers, right? But famously, the first two Frenchmen that we can trace through archival sources on the Llano were the Maillé brothers. Pierre and Paul. They were born in Montreal in the early 1700s. These two fur traders uh, set out from the Illinois country, uh, which you can kind of see pictured on this map. Uh, this is a French map from 1718 showing supposed French possessions across uh, North America. And note the highlighting of waterways and water travel on this French map, right? Uh, these brothers set out across the Illinois country in 1739 to try to found, find a water route to Santa Fe. And knowing what we know today, that sounds ridiculous, right? But that's what they were hoping for. Um, they soon had to abandon that dream, though, when they abandoned their canoes uh, on the, uh, I think it was the Platte River, and they set out across land with some indigenous guidance. They eventually reached the Picuras Pueblo on July 20th, 1739, before proceeding on to Santa Fe, where they spend the winter. On their return trip, they gathered geographic information from the Pecos Puebloans before striking east and skirting the northern flank of the Llano, hitting the upper reaches of the Canadian eventually. From there, they fell in with Comanches, friendly to the idea of new opportunities for trade and alliance with the French along their water courses. The Comanches offered directions for continuing the route eastward with special note, quote, of the springs and watering places along this rough and dry canyon land. The Mayes returned to report their success to the French governor in Louisiana, who in turn outfitted another expedition to repeat the route and secure a trade link between French territories on the Mississippi and Spanish New Mexico. But the French officials conceived of this as a waterborne expedition, outfitting canoes for the journey and recruiting voyageurs these canoemen of the French fur trade. Their mistake is somewhat understandable, given what we know about French empire in North America, right? Um, basically, uh, they, they had been able to manage to put together this empire that stretched from Montreal to New Orleans using clever indigenous technology of canoe building and portage routes, right? These overland carrying places between watersheds. Um, you'll see details from the map here, right? This French river world stretched um, from Canada into Louisiana, uh, and the French simply hoped to repeat the pattern further west as they looked to connect to Santa Fe. But the expedition that ascended the difficult to navigate Canadian River, the boats had to be abandoned. Morale soon broke down, and the expedition failed. Only the Malays continued to cross the open prairies, the rest turned back to Louisiana. And again, they entered the canyon lands of the northern Llano to reach Santa Fe for a second time. But this time, their success was repaid with a prison sentence in Mexico City from the Santa Fe uh, governor. And then, uh, and this ended kind of the last official French expedition onto the staked plains. But even though official expeditions ceased after the Malay efforts, Courier de Bois, Right? These kind of illegal French fur traders uh, may have continued to press the advantage in the southern plains. It's hard to know because they don't leave many written records, right? Um, scattered records, but they're trying to get away from French authority. They're seeking out new trade relations with the Comanche, the Pawnee, the Wichita, etc. 
And it's worth noting that even Pierre Vial, who eventually becomes Pedro Vial, this Spanish explorer, uh, by the time Spain takes over in the 1780s, had begun his career as one of these courier de bois, these uh, woods runners or river runners of the French river world. Um, he had been a smuggler on the Red River and earned a reputation as a contrabandista in the Spanish lingo of the day. Despite this early failure of the French to capitalize on their penetration of the Llano, Hispanos did continue to utilize the high plains and relied on its water sources to pasture sheep, as we've heard, hunt bison, and trade with the Comanches who held power in the region. This engagement with the staked plains along specific water corridors left an indelible mark on the landscape. During his exploration of the region in 1820, for instance, Stephen Long reported these well-worn trails of at least 20 pack trains that cut from the pueblos of New Mexico northeast toward the headwaters of the Canadian River. Another ancient pathway reported by some of his uh, underlings, right, ran through the Blackwater Draw Defile, pushing east from the Pecos River Valley onto the Llano itself until it reached the upper portions of the Yellow House Draw. And you can see this map noting some of these prominent trade routes, following those old draws and playa routes. Uh, eventually, this trail terminus ended at the Canyon del Rescate, uh, today's Ransom Canyon, which we visited the other day. Long reported hieroglyphics, or pictographs as he called them, figures of men and horses meant to design, designate certain sites uh, and past trail deals that occurred between these Cibuleros and Comancheros on one end and the Comanches that would meet them on the other end. Typically, they were meant for water courses, right? Uh, he even came across a party of Kiowas on the way to a rendezvous with com some Comanchero traders out of New Mexico in a well-known watering spot. During the winter of 1808, Anthony Glass lived and tra traveled with a group of Pawnee hunters along the rolling plains um, to the east of us. He recorded how such waterscape rendezvous often happened between different indigenous groups as well as traders um, and Comancheros. On October 7th, for instance, the leader of his party, Awakea, had sent word to nearby Comanches that they would soon assemble along a creek bank known for its good water for the purposes of parlaying and trading. The Comanches arrived first, setting up tents. Um, Glass and his Pawnee companions uh, eventually arrived, gifting blankets and trinkets. The watering hole proved a necessary venue for this kind of multi-day exchange since, quote, our whole party, party became very numerous, containing men, women, and children, near 1,000 souls total, and three times that number of horses and mules. Even if Glass's figures are a little exaggerated, large trade rendezvous between mounted and mobile populations like the Comanches necessitated, necessitated such geographic and logistical planning to ensure sufficient graze for livestock and plenty of water to go around. Similar creekside commerce occurred uh, on October 21st and 22nd in Glass's journal and later on in the winter down the Colorado River of the Rolling Plains. Water did not factor into trade considerations alone, however. Knowledge of watering sites and well-watered pathways across the Llano served as tools for native people as they directed and at times exploited the contours of Euro-American travel across the region. For instance, Comanches willingly cooperated and provided information to those that they deemed worthwhile trade partners or allies, as they did with, and when they guided Bial across the High Plains in the 18th century. But false information about resources on the Llano could, could prove deadly, and several reports from throughout the period describe how Comanche informants knowingly misled interlopers with bad information about water levels, water locations, the presence of beaver on the Llano, and directions towards well-watered draws. So just as waterscapes could be sites of collaboration then, they could also be sites of contest. Knowledge and control of watering places and waterline routes shaped the terms of interaction as much, if not more, on the semi-arid portions of the continent as they did on the better water regions north and west of the Llano. I'm going to leave us with one final image that kind of foreshadows the conflict that would play out across the High Plains between native people 
and incoming uh, Americans during the latter part of the 19th century. Right? The first image, the one further from me, right, um, might be a familiar one to us. Okay? Um, this is a, a Remington painting. Um, it's of the famous Buffalo Wallow fight, which took place during the Red River War of 1874, in what was probably, historians speculate now, a half-filled playa. Rains overnight helped the outnumbered American scouts hold out long enough for reinforcements as they battled Comanche and Kiowas. But in other incidents throughout the Red River War and its aftermath, water or the lack of it would determine success or failure for US forces against the Comanches Kiowas and other people of the Southern Plains. Probably a less familiar image, but one I'd like to close with, is this Kiowa drawing of what is likely the same battle. Right? Um, while less romanticized than Remington's image, the key feature of the struggle is still prominently highlighted in this native drawing, the playa. Waterscapes like this besieged playa were the, were the places where native peoples and Euro-Americans Euro came together to determine the fate of the continent one way or the other. As we think about the ways to teach both the past and the present of the Llano, I think it would benefit of all of us to think about human interactions, not just upon the landscape, but especially in the contested and charged waterscapes like playas, springs, rivers, and even whole aquifers that determine the fate of history in North America. Thank you. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Yes, in the front there. Are you, are you going to make this uh, paper available? Uh, I, can, I can certainly make the slides and paper available, yeah. I mean, it's in a rough draft, but yes, I can do that, well, for sure. Well, it sound rough to me, but. <laughs> uh, Thanks. Uh, and in that, will there be a link to, to seeing that uh, Wonderful yes, I can do that. Absolutely. Great. Yep. I've got. Just email you? Yeah, please just email me. Um, I can I can give out my email if people want to write it down or um, it's j o h n dot w i l l i a m so john dot william dot nelson at t t u dot e d u. You can always come up to me afterwards if you need it too. I see another hand. Yes. Yeah, I, you mentioned a, a place name that, that uh, I've heard before, and it's always intrigued me. Yeah. And I'm not going to get it right, but it's El Puerto or something. Uh, uh, Rivejenos, yeah. Yeah, what, where is that? Is it's, that uh, so that's a good question. I would have to go back and look. It might be on this map. Let's see. It's on the northern line, right? So it's somewhere up. I will have to look. I will let you know, right? Um, basically, it's the one across the Kitty K Trail there, I believe, okay, that comes down into the, the Paladuro Canyon eventually. You got it? Yes, right before Kitty K. Yeah, Puerto de Rivejenos is up there, kind of. You see where it is? Yeah, um, so straight up from my finger, a little bit further, right? You got it? Okay, there you go. Other, other questions or yeah, comments? Your whole thesis about how we think about ourselves now in the past through more through water, I think, is wonderful. Could you talk a little bit about the map, um, that fascinating map that the first kind of one looked like it had a lot of veins and capillaries? It did, yeah. Well, so there's this one, and then there's that one. This one. No, uh, yeah. I know oh, the, this one. I actually, yeah. yeah I know so about this. The bio map. This is a, and again, I can provide the source for this too. This is a nice um, map of all the river drainages in North America, or uh, the contiguous United States, I should say, right? Um, the idea highlighting that besides maybe the Great Basin, right, it's, it's all of the rivers that kind of form the United States. So it's a different way of thinking. I always show this to my students um, in my US history survey, uh, because I teach the early half of the US history survey, and they are always thinking about you know, railroads and, and uh, interstates and things like that. And they, they have a hard time conceptualizing the continent that was mostly uh, directed by the waterways, not by roads and, and canals and uh, trains and eventually airplanes, right? Um, and so I always flash this map up on the first day of class and get them to think about, so what, 
river drainage you actually live in, right? Because it does matter to, to the history very much so. And it helps them to think a little outside the box that way. Uh, but I'm happy to provide that, that map and that link uh, because it's not my map, so yeah. So these are river? Uh, river drainages, right? Watersheds, drainages. we would say, yeah. Because yeah, I'm not from Michigan. I'm looking at the Great Lakes, and it looks like it's a bunch of rivers. But I guess this Well, yeah, they've got the Michigan. Great Lakes filled in a little funny. But yeah, OK. Um, but yeah, like this would be the continental divide between um, you know, the Mississippi River drainage and the, the St. Lawrence Great Lakes drainage, for instance. Yeah. Are there anything else? I think we're probably close to time, if not at time. So yes, one more. So I just don't know the geography, but you said they wanted to get to Santa Fe. Yes. Why would they go through the Yana Les to get there? What, what was it? Uh, well, they're trying to get there from a couple different directions, right? The, the French are in the Illinois country. Um, they're also at Nacogdoches in Upper Louisiana, and they're at New Orleans, right? So they're, they're not quite sure in relation to how to get to Santa Fe, right? Because this whole interior region is still not mapped in the, the 1700s. They know that Santa Fe is west of them and probably south of them in most cases. So some of them end up on the Llano as they're trying to get there. Others end up you know, going up the Platte or Missouri rivers, and they don't get anywhere closer to Santa Fe. Uh, they end up at the Rocky Mountains, but um, they're trying to get there, so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. But so it's I, I was just wondering if there was like a river going in that direction or something. The Canadian's the best bet for them, uh, okay. yeah. Um, so they but go up the Arkansas and hit the, the Canadian. Uh, yeah, yeah. But they think the Canadian will lead them there. And it, as late as Thomas Jefferson's presidency, right, he's hoping that the Red River will connect Santa Fe with the Louisiana Purchase, and he's, he's wrong, but that's his hope, right? Yeah. Good. All right. Well, I'll wrap it up then. Thank you.